it's great to have you with us. How 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 long have you been associated with what became Langham? Um, well, it depends almost where you start, I suppose. 1978 was when I first got to know John Stott at a personal level. Mm -hmm. uh, 1988, 89 was when he invited me to become one of the trustees of the Evangelical Literature Trust, as it then was as John Hayden, who's on the call, will well remember. Um, and then it was in year 2000, 2001, that he asked me to take on the leadership of the the Langham movement as, as a whole. Um, so it depends where you start, but certainly since 2001, I've been involved with Langham in a, in a professional, in an employed capacity. And I guess the invitation went out to folk to join us to hear a little bit about the growth uh, in Langham. And, and I just... You know, we're all curious as to, from your particular perspective, um, whether you can identify any areas of, of growth and what that looks like to you. Yeah, indeed, John. In fact, it would be, uh, it'd be more a question of where can you not see growth because it's been almost <laughs> everywhere. I, it's also just worth just saying to everybody uh, who some will remember. Actually, today, the, the 27th of April, uh, would have birthday. been John Scott's birthday. Mm. Uh, he would have been 102 if he'd still been alive. Uh, but the 27th of April was John's birthday. And if I could just uh, tell you, everybody, where I actually am at the moment. I'm sorry, that's not what I meant to do. Um, just just so you can see, I'm actually down at uh, the Hooksies, which is where John Stott had his uh, writing retreat. And that's where I am at the moment, doing some reading and writing and study here. So that's what I'm looking out at that now, except it's a bit sort of dark and gloomy at the moment. But... Uh, mm. But that's the rather nice sort of view that I have. Um, yeah, John, I mean, I, I thought, um, let me just click myself off there. Um, as people will know, we have this campaign in the UK at the moment, which is called Magnify, which is a very, a very good word, I think, for, uh, for this. And of course, it means to magnify the Lord. But magnify does mean to make something bigger, or at least appear bigger. And uh, I think that is certainly something which I've been absolutely astonished with. If I go back to 1989, when, as John Hayden will remember, I, I joined the trustees of the Literature Trust, the Evangelical Literature Trust, it was it had been going since John Stott founded about 1971. It was largely distributing books to seminaries and to uh, graduates and students in the majority world. We had a small catalogue which had about 300 books in it. It was uh, photocopied every year. Uh, John Hayden was running this from his uh, church and an office in Ipswich, um, and uh, that was had been going, and it was very good. But now, um, you know, these, whatever it is, 23, 24 years later, uh, we have a warehouse in uh, Carlisle, we have a service centre, we have staff, uh, and in this last year, the last financial year, Langham Literature um, sent 15,000 books to some 700 seminaries in 79 countries, which is really quite remarkable in terms of the development of their libraries, which was, of course, John Stott's vision way back then. But in total, that warehouse distributed some 230,000 books uh, in 90 different countries, um, and many of them, in fact, were, were digital as well. So uh, that work still continues. What ELT was founded to, which was to get books into the hands of pastors and seminaries around the world, but the word magnify, um, I've been trying to think of other synonyms, you know, things that mean something similar. And the word amplify comes to mind because what um, Langham has been doing is also magnifying or amplifying the voice of Christians and theologians and scholars in the majority world. That is the voice of those who we usually didn't get to hear, those of us at any rate who live in the West. And we've been doing that through uh, our own publishing. Langham is now publishing uh, about 50 books a year. There's a large list and a big catalogue, almost entirely by majority world authors. And we're supporting 23 indigenous evangelical publishing houses uh, in countries like Cambodia and other parts of the world in order to enable them to be producing and, and publishing books for themselves. And then, uh, John, as you'll know, Quite recently, just a few weeks ago, just a few weekends ago in Prague, in the Czech Republic, we saw the launch of the Central and Eastern European Bible Commentary, uh, which entirely produced by about 100 scholars, many of them Langham scholars, 
from 20 different countries, from Estonia up in the Baltics, just south of Finland, right down to uh, Greece and the Baltic states down in the Mediterranean. Huge swathe of uh, Central Eastern Europe. And that book has, has just come out. Mm -hmm. And then one final thing on the literature sort of thing, just very contemporary, just this week while I've been here at Hooksies, uh, I got um, an email from a man called Jeremy Weber, who I've not met yet, but he's one of the editors of Christianity Today, which, as many of you know, was a very prestigious North American, well, international Christian magazine, uh, asking about, wanting to see myself and possibly Tayo to discuss how he can increase the voice of Langham scholars and Langham books mm. within Christianity Today, the magazine. So, you know, we're getting known in that sense. Yeah. The voice is being amplified. And even uh, as we speak, we have an Egyptian, uh, Hani Hanna, who will be taking over as the uh, overall program director for Lang Literature from Peter Quant, who's retired. And uh, that would be a matter for prayer, I think, just to pray for Hani. He's Egyptian. He's yeah. uh, a Langham scholar himself. And he'll be taking on the leadership of Langham Literature from, I think, from August or September of this year. So it's that's, that's just you, magnifying and amplifying Langham literature. <laughs> you mentioned um, Christianity today. I mean, it was only in January, wasn't it, that they had a selection of five top books they were recommending uh, to uh, the global church. And four of those five were all Langham scholars and produced. Uh, four, uh, three of them were actually produced by Langham as well. That's, yes, uh, that's right. Exactly. The three of them were published by Langham. That's right. So he's obviously already observing this. Mm. Um, and then just in the last issue of Christianity Today, they had a an interview, oh. I think, of Johanna, uh, about Johanna Catanaccio's book on reading John's gospel from a Palestinian oh. perspective. Uh, again, it's, it's just of that quality uh, and seniority being recognized in a, a prestigious Western publication that's that's well known in the in the US particularly. So you've given us uh, magnify and amplify, but you haven't even touched on preaching yet. Um, what's what's your adjective there? Or uh... <laughs> yeah, well, well, my word there would be multiply. <laughs> um, magnify also implies multiply, because you see, in two thousand and one, when I joined Langham and John Stott was very much my boss and so on, uh, he said to me that he was he'd been invited to go and um, take some preaching seminars in the Latin America in, in Peru and Argentina. And would I like to come with him? So, of course, I couldn't say no. So in October 2001, we went to Argentina and Peru and we did a week long in each country uh, with 60 or 70 uh, local pastors and Christian leaders and preachers. Uh, and then we sort of looked at each other and said, well, that was great. But, you know, where does that go from? here because you can't change the culture of preaching with just a one-week seminar mm -hmm. um, and so what we then managed to persuade the Langham Partnership Council the international group to do was to accept Langham preaching as a third program because we'd had Langham literature and Langham scholars to come to in a minute and so Langham preaching was born and in 2002 Jonathan Lamb was appointed as the uh, leader as the program director and you know these cars that go from sort of naught to 60 in 10 seconds or something? Well, Langham preaching has grown from two to um, 90 uh, in the last 20 years, because there, in, again, just last year, 2022, uh, there were 104 Langham preaching movements in 89 different countries, because some countries have more than one movement. Uh, we held 270 training events, um, they, the registration for these reached 9,800. So, you know, we're reaching nearly 10,000 pastors every year in, in Langham preaching. And the great thing to me personally is uh, that the leadership of, of this has now almost completely indigenized. That's to say, uh, the great majority of those who are doing this teaching and training and leading these movements are resident in the majority world. They are African or Asian or Latin American and so on. Now, mm -hmm. the way in which that is most manifest to me uh, in a paradoxical kind of way is that I ain't doing it anymore <laughs> because uh, for about the first eight to 10 years of my involvement with Langham, I was, well, I was running around the world um, involved with the initiation of preaching movements in, well, I wrote down uh, earlier today, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, South Africa, Peru, Argentina, Ecuador, Jamaica, Bolivia, Ethiopia, Spain, Indonesia, Vanuatu, the Solomon Islands, Egypt, Albania, Romania. Um, so I was pretty busy doing all of that. These are countries where 
in those early 2000s, we were able to initiate Langham Preet, and some of them went back to two or three times in a row. But these last, um, I don't know, last 10 years, I don't do any of that at all. I, I'm not involved in directly preaching and training and Langham preaching seminars, unless they ask me to come and, you know, do some celebratory 10 year anniversary event or uh, to initiate a kind of lineup visit. So this, this is a wonderful reality that uh, the Langham preaching program is magnified by multiplying, um, but multiplying in a way which I think is very healthy because it's not just us in the West, as it were, multiplying what we do elsewhere in the world, but enabling um, leaders, very senior leaders in those countries uh, to do it themselves. And uh, that's, of course, happening under the leadership of Paul Windsor um, and his his global leadership team. So and and just for prayer, again, as, as a prayer item next week, uh, there's going to be a meeting in Latin America of some 80 national and local leaders of Langham preaching in Latin America. The, the work there is entirely led by a team of uh, four or five um, people who, who run it from Bolivia and Colombia and elsewhere. And they're but, gathering these people together for a, a major consultation on their work and their progress and their strategy into the future. So uh, the Latin American preaching leadership team is meeting next week. And I think we should be praying for that. If you were to, I mean, take a step back it again and just look at the overall i mean obviously growth is is fabulous and we can give praise and thanks for that but growth quite often gives some um, rise to problems and yeah. is there anything in your mind that um that such growth um does actually um impact that that we need to think and pray about I mean, I'm well, not suggesting yes. you get personal here. <laughs> no, no, no. That's that is a good question because I think you know you, you, some people remember that one of the slogans that John Stott used to use regularly about the problems of the global church, and he didn't just mean in the majority world, but all over the world. One of the problems is growth, <laughs> depth. Uh, that is where things grow bigger but aren't deeply rooted. And he, of course, was thinking of Christian discipleship. Um, and pastoral training and maturity of the church and so on. Um, but for a while, I do recall that Jonathan Lamb and then Paul Windsor were a bit concerned, well, if the Langham preaching program is growing so fast, that is, we are being invited to so many countries, we need to be careful that we don't grow without depth, that is, we don't you know, become shallow or just do things because we're asked to, which is one reason why, uh, under Paul's leadership, they develop these, what well, I think they call them growth barometers, that is mm. criteria by which they will evaluate how a national movement is maturing across a range of different criteria, whether that's financially self-sufficient, uh, training their own trainers, uh, producing materials for their own curriculum and so on, um, becoming eventually, we trust, entirely self-sufficient. In other words, that, that, that they will still be lying on preaching programs, but they don't need any further financial or personnel investment from, from the center. So I think we are aware of that, that you can grow too fast. Uh, and uh, obviously another area too is that the more you grow, the more people will be involved and the more people are involved, the more sin is involved because we're all sinners. <laughs> yeah. and, and we're all sinners in different cultures and different languages. And therefore, you know, the Tower of Babel is still a bit of a reality in the world that, that uh, there's always the possibility of misunderstanding. And by God's grace, I think we we on the whole within Langham, we, we are aware of that and we counteract it by prayer and by regular consultation and staying together. But it, it, is, it is sometimes a challenge and one needs to be aware of that as, as a human organization uh, that we're all fallen, sinful, fallible people who sometimes get it wrong. I guess um, also that kind of um, increase in the number of people means that given global situations, there's always a significant number of our friends and colleagues that are involved in, well, first of all, desperate um, pastoral situations of their own and for their families and for their communities, but then also in places of war and famine and flood and whatever as well. And those tend to to add a problem aspect to um to growth 
very much so. And uh, I, I think we should be aware that, you know, we have Langham scholars in quite a number of the countries that are ranked among the most dangerous places for anybody to be a Christian. Mm. Uh, and that's just a fact. And we praise God for that. Uh, we know of one Langham scholar who's just about to complete, who's going back to a country in Central Asia, where there's almost no other Christians and where it's illegal to evangelize and so on. He's going back there. Mm. So, yes. And of course, as you say, we, we have uh, wonderful Langham scholars and seminaries, hugely courageous in Ukraine, uh, doing a, a amazing yep. work, even in the midst of bereavement and loss of friends and just their whole almost well they say that their very humanity is being threatened yeah, the refugee uh, hubs and, and networks yes, yeah. refugee yeah. Hubs, yeah. Yeah. and then of course we, we've got scholars in the middle east and in in, uh, in lebanon and elsewhere and in some very challenging parts of asia so yes um that is a reality and but it's also a privilege isn't it i mean it, it it's a privilege to feel that mm -hmm. through through langham and this great network of scholars and writers and preachers and trainers that we are part of almost the book of Revelation. You know, we're part of God's family who live and in some cases give their lives, you know, for the word of God and the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and it is it's humbling and an amazing privilege to be, uh, to share with them, uh, even if we don't, you know, even if we're not in anything like the situation they're in, that in prayer and in our conversations with them and our correspondence with them we can somehow participate in their sufferings what about as you um look around and uh, and survey langham's activity and um the way things have gone on the growth side do do you see any do you personally have any disappointments or is there anything that um you wanted to happen whose time has not come yet or do you feel anything's been thwarted by pressures in uh, in the world and whatever just curious as to whether there's anything there that um challenges um, my my um temp my tendency is to be much more encouraged than to be disappointed that that's <laughs> happened um i mean obviously we have not yet really been able to make much impact in what sometimes called mina that is the middle east and north africa mm. uh you know the whole heartland of the muslim world uh mm. we've got good scholars in in lebanon and in egypt but it, across that wider part we're, we're still struggling so there are parts of the world where our presence is very minimal uh, but that's partly for political and religious reasons um there's always the challenge, as you know, John, yourself very well, as sort of the national executive in the UK, there's always the challenge that our vision outstrips our resources, or at least that, you know, we have, to, it's a challenge for our resources to keep up with our with our vision and our strategic plan. But by God's grace, we we continue to, to work with that. I mean, at this moment, um, in the scholar program, which I could talk about a little, one of the items for prayer there is that, um, with the cost of living crisis and inflation, mm. uh, we know that a number of our scholars, particularly studying in the West, which of course only about half of our scholars study, but those who are in the West, uh, this is an issue which is affecting their budgets and their families and so on. And so the Langham Scholar Program is, is struggling to say, how can we find the additional financial resources to meet needs which we didn't foresee um, mm -hmm. when we were planning the budgets for the for this in the strategic plan a year or two ago and as you know that's something which Riyad Cassis is wrestling with at the moment how do we how do we cope with that that, uh, that that this is affecting people who are working and studying in the west especially if they've got families mm. yeah and if you also look around and see what's happening is there anything that particularly surprises you over the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years or, or whatever. You know. yeah, so anything I think, that stands out, it's, it's, it's taken you by surprise. Yeah, I think um, the way, the way in some ways John Stott's vision was so foresighted. I mean, whether he was aware of it or not, but his vision, particularly for the scholars, he wanted, you know, he, he wanted to, ch to change the culture of theological education in many seminaries to make it more evangelical, uh, to develop the theological resources of the majority world church and so on. And you might have thought, even back when I sort of started working with all with Langham scholars or so back in around about 2000, you know, the number was not great. 
Um, and, you know, a lot of the seminaries were still very liberal. And so the, it was it was making a difference, but not yet what we see now. And I suppose the, the, the third word that I was going to suggest after my um, <laughs> uh, amplify and multiply was fructify. <laughs> I don't know whether, um, uh, I think it is a word, but you know what it means, to make fruitful. And the, the scholar program has been bearing enormous fruit, I think. Um, I remember back in 2004, uh, when the big question came up as to whether or not Langham would be prepared to invest in having our scholars, Langham scholars, studying not in Britain and America anymore, well, still, but not only, not only in Britain and America, but would they be willing to support scholars doing their PhDs in majority world seminaries in places like the Nairobi Evangelical Graduate School of Theology or in South Africa or elsewhere? And we had a huge research project. We, we consulted everybody. And in 2004, considerable, you know, re not reluctance, but caution, the International Council and the board said, yes, we will choose to invest in majority world doctoral programs. A few years later, in 2010, we came up with the Beirut benchmarks, that is criteria by which uh, a seminary could be recognized as having an authentic, high quality doctoral program. Um, our, one of our colleagues, Ian Shaw, has been involved with helping those to develop. And we now have more than 50% of those who are currently doing their doctorates, that is current Langham scholars, are not studying in the West. They are studying in majority world contexts where there's high quality, evangelical, doctoral level education. And that is largely because those places are have got Langham scholars teaching there. Mm. Langham scholars who've done their own doctorates who are now uh, fruitfully developing others in as, as Langham uh, doctorate programs. Uh, we had a lovely interview with um, with um, uh, Elliot, with um, Angu just recently, who was um, mentored by Havila Dharamraj, one of our wonderful Langham scholars. And so that has, in a sense, borne fruit as a second generation Langham scholar uh, in that place. So that fruitfulness of the program that's only one way it's being fruitful, but that is one very key way. It genuinely is, I think. It really is changing the quality, the standards, uh, and the depth of evangelical theological education in many parts of the world. Last opportunity before we go into groups. Is there anything that um, you uh, just want to reinforce or, or mention that we haven't had a chance to cover about for prayer and uh, for either for petition or praise or? Uh, no, I think I probably mentioned almost everything I, I had thought of when, when I jotted it down earlier this afternoon. Just one last thing. Um, I, one of the joys to me very recently was when a, a dear brother called Paul Swarup, who I taught as an undergraduate in the 1980s back in India when he was a student at UBS, then did his master's in America, did his PhD in Cambridge, is, uh, and went back to India to uh, into leadership in the Church of North India back in October, was unanimously elected as the Bishop mm. of Delhi. Um, yeah. It's hard to believe he's now 60. <laughs> you know, I think of him still in his 20s when, when he was a student and we were uh, mm. running around there in India. But that sort of, you see someone grow, develop, uh, and enter into really senior, challenging leadership in a church which, gosh, needs godly and evangelical leadership. Mm. And you see someone like Paul sort of doing that, and you just rejoice, and you say, Lord, bless him and pray for him. Uh, in that role. I, I think that's a stunning uh, thing for Langham, just as a, a, a sort of outsider coming in a few years ago, seven years ago now, that, that Langham is really there for the long haul with communities and with uh, pastors and teachers. It's, it's not something that gives something for this year and expects mm. a payment for that or in, in any kind of way. It works with a generation so far and i think that's spectacular 